On November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky, the lawyer of global financier Bill Browder, was murdered for uncovering a $230 million corruption scheme carried out by officials within Russia's Interior Ministry. Bill Browder has since made a vow to Sergei's memory and begun a campaign to seek justice for Sergei and to ensure accountability for those involved in his death. Welcome to Dissidents and Dictators, a series of conversations by the Human Rights Foundation dedicated to exposing and challenging authoritarianism around the world. Bill Browder became the biggest capitalist in Russia and retained that title for a decade. But his focus was turned from investments to activism when the Moscow offices of his investment fund were raided as part of a state-orchestrated fraud. His tax advisor, Sergei Magnitsky, was murdered for the findings of his investigation into that fraud after enduring 358 days of torture in pretrial detention. Bill's campaign for justice for Sergei resulted in the passage of legislation in the United States that eventually became known as the Global Magnitsky Act, named in Sergei's memory. The act allows the president to issue visa bans and asset freezes against individuals who commit serious human rights abuses or acts of corruption, and to ensure that these individuals are not afforded a haven in Western financial systems. Today, Bill travels around the world to advocate for the passage of Magnitsky legislation in other countries. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Galino, International Legal Associate at the Human Rights Foundation, and I'm honored to welcome our guest today, Bill Browder, the champion of the Global Magnitsky Act, to talk about just how and why he's become a thorn in Putin's side, what makes the Kremlin such a threat to democracy, and why Magnitsky legislation is so critical to address this threat. And finally, we'll discuss Sergei's legacy and his message of resilience. So Bill, can you start out by telling us just how you made your way to become the biggest capitalist in Russia and in fact, in all of Eastern Europe, because some of your family members adhered to a very different ideology. Indeed, my, my grandfather was a uh, communist. He was the, in fact, in fact, not just a communist, but he was the leader of the American Communist Party from 1932 to 1945. And so when I was going through my teenage rebellion in the 1970s, uh, I, I, I was looking for a way to rebel from this family of communists. And I came up with the perfect way, which was to put on a suit and tie and become a capitalist. <laughs> so I became a capitalist. I went to Stanford Business School and I graduated business school in 1989, which was the year that the Berlin Wall came down. Mm -hmm. And as I was looking for my uh, post business school career, one day I had this epiphany, which is that if my grandfather was the biggest communist in America and the Berlin Wall has just come down, I'm going to try to become the biggest capitalist <laughs> in Eastern Europe. And that's what I set out to do. And, and I actually succeeded. I set up an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund, which focused on the Russian stock market. I moved out to Moscow in 1996. And my fund grew from nothing to the becoming the largest foreign investment fund in Russia with four and a half billion dollars of assets under management. Well, I think it's safe to say that for myself and many listeners, our rebellious teenage years may have taken a slightly different form. So fast forward to 2018, it's the Helsinki summit, and Putin says he would be ready to hand over foreign military intelligence officers who were involved in election hacking if the United States handed over you to Russia. And it, it actually even took a vote in the Senate to ensure that you would not be. And I mean, you've now dodged at least, what, eight or so international arrest warrants. So how did you come to be Putin's number one for an enemy, this, this thorn in his side and the subject of so many of his clearly apoplectic episodes and, and illegal rendition schemes? So Putin uh, hates me for a very good reason, um, which is that I've threatened his money by coming up with a piece of legislation 
called the Magnitsky Act. And to understand the legislation, let me tell you the story of Sergei Magnitsky and myself, and you'll then see clearly what the issue is. Mm -hmm. So I had this investment fund in Russia, and I was discovering that all the companies I was investing in, these large state-owned companies, were being robbed blind by the oligarchs who ran these companies. And I decided to stop the, the stealing. I was going to research how they did the stealing and then publicize the research through the international media. So I started to expose massive multi-billion dollar fraud and scams at Gazprom, the biggest gas company in Russia, at Spare Bank, the National Savings Bank, at Unified Energy Systems, the National Electricity Company. And as you can imagine, the people who were benefiting from these frauds didn't want to be exposed. And so after a period of time, after uh, about, I, I lived there for 10 years, and for some period of time I was getting away with this, but on November 13th, 2005, I was flying back to Moscow from London, from weekend in London, and I was stopped at the, at the airport. I was arrested. I was put in the airport detention center. I was kept there for 15 hours. And then I was deported from Russia and declared a threat to national security. <clears throat> After this, uh, it became clear that the Russians were going to do some terrible stuff. So I evacuated all my staff. <clears throat> uh, I liquidated all of my holdings in Russia. And we got our people and our money out. And I thought that was the end of the story, but it turned out it wasn't anywhere near the end of the story. About 18 months later, my office in Moscow, which at this point was empty other than a secretary, was raided by 25 police officers. 25 more police officers raided the office of the American law firm I used in Moscow. They were looking for the corporate documents, the stamps, seals, and certificates for our investment holding companies, which they found at our law firm's office. They seized those documents. And the next thing we know, the documents were used in a highly complex fraud to steal $230 million of taxes that we had paid to the Russian government from the Russian government. I found that fraud out because I hired a young lawyer named Sergei Magnitsky to investigate. Sergei was a 35-year-old lawyer. He worked for an American law firm. He was the smartest guy I knew in, in Russia. And it took him a little while to figure it out. But when he figured it out, he was astounded. I was astounded. And we were sure that the theft of $230 million from, from Russia wouldn't be sanctioned by Putin because we thought Putin was a nationalist. Uh, we thought he was a patriot. And we thought this must be a rogue operation. And so we, um, <clears throat> we wrote criminal complaints to every different branch of, of law enforcement. I gave TV, radio, newspaper interviews, and Sergei gave sworn testimony against these corrupt officials who were involved. And we waited for the good guys to get the bad guys. Turns out in Putin's Russia, there are no good guys. Instead, they, uh, the authorities arrested Sergei Magnitsky. They put him in pretrial detention where he was then tortured to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight beds and left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. And the purpose of all this was to try to get him to withdraw his testimony against the corrupt police officers and to get him to sign a false confession to say he stole the $230 million and he did so on my instruction. And Sergei is a man of an incredible principle. And for him, the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was much more painful than any physical pain they were inflicting on him. And he refused to do that. And so they just kept on ratcheting up the pressure and the torture. It got worse and worse and worse. And six months into this, he ended up um, developing terrible pains in his stomach. He lost 20 kilos and he was diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones and needing an operation, which was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. 
A week before the operation, they came to him again, again asking him to sign a false confession. Again, he refused. And in retaliation, they abruptly moved him from the prison that had a hospital to a maximum security prison, uh, in um, uh, which <clears throat> which has no medical facilities and no way to treat his uh, pancreatitis, no operation. And at the maximum security prison, his health completely broke down. He went into a terrible downward spiral, constant agonizing, ear-piercing pain. And they completely and absolutely refused him medical attention. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different requests, desperate requests for medical attention to every different branch of the criminal justice system. And every one of those requests was either ignored or denied in writing. On the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. At that moment, the maximum security prison people didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore, and so they put him in an ambulance, sent him to a different prison that had a medical wing. When he arrived there, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell. They chained him to a bed, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat him until he died. He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. I got the news the next day, and it was so terrible, so painful, so traumatic, that I made a vow to his memory, to his family, to myself, that I was going to put aside everything else I was doing and go after the people who killed him to make sure they face justice. And that's what I did. And we couldn't get justice inside of Russia because Putin personally got involved in the cover-up. He personally exonerated everybody who played a role in this case. He gave promotions and state honors to some of the people most complicit. And so I said to myself, if we can't get justice inside of Russia, we need to get justice outside of Russia. And then I said, how do we get justice outside of Russia? And the answer was that this crime, this this murder, this torture and this murder were were committed in order to cover up the, the theft of $230 million. And the people who stole that $230 million don't keep it in Russia because as easily as they stole it, it could be stolen from them. They keep that money in the West, in the United States, in London, in Geneva, in France. They send their kids to boarding schools in Switzerland and their girlfriends on shopping trips to Milan and their wives to South Beach. And we came up with this idea, which is we might not be able to prosecute them for torture and murder in America or in, in the UK, but we don't have to let them into these countries. We don't have to let them keep their money here. And I went to Washington and I met with a Democratic senator from Maryland, Benjamin Cardin, and a Republican senator from Arizona, John McCain. And I said, I told them the story I've just shared with you. And I said, can we freeze their assets and ban their visas? And that became known as the Magnitsky Act. They launched it in 2010, and it went for a vote two years later. And in in a town in Washington, which is a town where nobody can agree on everything, uh, it passed the Senate 92 to 4. It passed the House of Representatives with 89%. And it became a federal law on, on December 14th, 2012. And Vladimir Putin went out of his mind. For him, this, is, this was like completely and absolutely unacceptable. He's, his whole life is devoted to stealing money, taking people hostage, killing people, and then keeping that money safe in the West. And for him, the idea that all of a sudden, the money in the West that he thought was safe is no longer safe was an absolute terrible body blow. And he made it his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act. He banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families in retaliation. He sent his emissary, a lawyer, female lawyer named Natalia Veselnitskaya to go to Trump Tower on June 9th, 2016, before Trump was elected, to ask Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort that if Donald Trump gets elected, can he repeal the Magnitsky Act? And I'm happy to say that they haven't succeeded. In fact, the Magnitsky Act has been expanded not just to Russia, but all bad actors around the world. It's called the Global Magnitsky Act. It's been expanded to different countries. Canada has one now. UK has one. 
Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Kosovo have one. And this is turning into Putin's worst nightmare because he's a guy who kills for money and all of a sudden his money is at risk. I mean, Bill, we often hear criticism of sanctions because of the thinking that they'll do more harm than good to the locals. But this is legislation that, in fact, Boris Nemtsov, the slain Russian Democratic opposition leader, called the most pro-Russian law ever passed by foreign government. What, what makes Magnitsky sanctions so different and effective? Why are they so distinctive? So the old world of sanctions were to sanction a country, which was a terrible and blunt instrument which never achieved its objectives because if you impose sanctions on a whole country, then most of the people are, are not the, the perpetrators of the crimes, they're the victims of the crimes. Certainly mm -hmm. in Russia, most of the population is the victim of the Putin regime. And so if you're to sanction the country, you're sanctioning all the victims and the perpetrators are busy flying in plain loads of caviar and champagne for themselves while everybody else suffers. So that's a, that, that doesn't help. But here with the Magnitsky Act, we're not going after the country. We're, going out, we're, we're identifying in a highly surgical basis the individuals who have done the crimes. And we're saying those people should have their assets frozen and their visas canceled. And so we, we've protected the people of the country and we just go after the perpetrators. And they find that even more infuriating because they've always been able to dodge all these consequences. They've been able to enjoy a life of impunity and no longer. Right. And what you've described would clearly strike at the Achilles heel of both the Kremlin and that of other kleptocratic regimes around the world. What has been the biggest obstacle that you've encountered in seeking to push through Magnitsky legislation across the globe? Do you do you feel that this work has gotten easier as time goes on because more and more people are now familiar with the Magnitsky Act, or are your efforts still met with the same resistance as when you were first starting out with this campaign? In, in different countries, we have different experiences. So mm -hmm. it's kind of an obvious piece of legislation. Uh, and it's an obvious piece of legislation to, to pitch to any politician. The idea, should you or should you not let torturers and murderers come to your country, it's kind of a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. and, and so every elected person who I meet, who I make that pitch to, buys it. And they say, this is a good idea. However, every foreign ministry of every government really doesn't want to do this because the foreign ministry or the State Department or the foreign office here in the UK or wherever their job is to have smooth relations with the most heinous dictators no matter what. And they don't want to have to like start sanctioning people because they're going to have other countries mad at them. And so I've always had to fight. The fight has always been with the bureaucracy, with the, with the people in these foreign ministries. And the way that we conduct the fight is by finding uh, people who are elected politicians. No, you're never going to lose a vote from anyone in your constituency by standing up and saying, we want this to happen. And so I always go to the parliaments, not the governments, to do this. And I, and I get the parliaments to push it. And it's been very interesting because you know, the, the most recent country that's on deck is Australia. And I think that they're very likely to do it. Um, however, the other one that's on deck is the European Union. And the European Union is an extremely untransparent decision-making body where the foreign ministries sort of dominate as opposed to any elected politicians. And we've had a much tougher time getting it through the European Union, and we're going to get it done, but it's, it's, um, we've, we've met lots and lots of, of really ugly, behind-the-scenes bureaucratic resistance. In the first few years following the enactment of the Magnitsky Act, few individuals or entities were actually sanctioned. And as we finally saw this past July, the UK announced its first Magnitsky-style sanctions. And and we also recently saw that the EU would impose visa sanctions and asset freezes on officials in Belarus who are involved in the corruption and human rights abuses we've seen over the past few weeks. And, you know, you just mentioned that Australia and the EU are on deck now with this legislation. Is the Magnitsky Act now being used the way you intended it to be used? Absolutely. The, um, the United States 
is at the forefront of the use of the Magnitsky Act. I think at this point, if you combine the Russian Magnitsky list with the global Magnitsky list, we're close to 300 people or entities having been sanctioned. And there's all sorts of bad guys and maybe a few bad women all over the world uh, who have been sanctioned. Just last week, the um, uh, uh, four people from Uganda were sanctioned, two judges and two lawyers who were involved in, in effectively stealing babies from destitute Ugandan women and then organizing for their illegal adoption in America. And I can't think of a more heinous story than that one. And I was delighted to see them sanction uh, uh, people. There are 11 officials in Hong Kong involved in the crackdown on the peaceful demonstrators of Hong Kong who have been sanctioned. A number of Chinese officials involved in the genocide of the Uyghurs. A number of, of generals in Myanmar who are involved in the Rohingya genocide. And so this is being, becoming really well used. And it's something that all the victims rally around because it gives them something, uh, some, some way of, of leveling the, the, the playing field, at least slightly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Bill, with the personal experience that you have from having lived and worked in Russia and in carrying on Sergei's legacy now, if you had to really pinpoint it, what is it about the shall we say, Potemkin village that is Putin's regime that makes it one of the gravest threats to democracy and democratic values in the world today? Putin is not uh, a normal leader. He is a mafia boss. He, he truly is interested in just maximizing the theft of resources from his country for him and the people around him. And he's ready to do anything to keep those resources. And all of his foreign policy is about exporting corruption, about money laundering, about assass targeted assassinations, and about making geopolitical trouble wherever he can to keep himself relevant and to keep everybody else unstable. I, I really, I, what, I, what I've seen is just his, his conduct is so unbelievably bad. And most other world leaders are afraid of confronting him. They're, they're afraid of him. And as a result, he gets away with so much more than he, he could get away with if the West had a unified and tough approach towards him and towards Russia. And we had a proper, what I would call con criminal containment strategy. It used to be a containment strategy to stop the spread of communism. Now we need to stop the spread of his criminal activities. Mm. I want to dig into that point a little bit more, because why then, given what we know about Putin's regime, you know, between everything you just said, which I think certainly resonates with a lot of our listeners who are working really hard to pave the way for democracy in their own countries. So between that plus countless examples we have, like the case of the recent likely poisoning of leading opposition figure Alexei Navalny, who very acutely said that Putin is the biggest Russophobe there is. You know, with all of this, why do we still hear so much Putin apologism? It, it's, it, it's because there's an incredible amount of activity by the Russians spreading their money around the world, effectively buying up people to, to blunt the criticism. Mm. I live in London and they are sloshing money around London like you can't believe to members of the establishment, to members of the House of Lords, which is the uh, house of one of the ha two houses of parliament. Um, there's so much money being sloshed around here buying influence. And because of that, they, they, it, it creates a, um, a counter narrative because there are people who are ready to put their credibility on the line to support the Russians. It's more prudent, I should say. So it's now been 15 years since you were expelled from Russia. Do you envision a day when you step foot in Russia again of your own free will? I, I can imagine that Putin is not going to succeed in being a dictator for life. It seems to me, if you look at how these dictatorships work, that some moment 
could be soon, could be in the medium term, the Russians have had enough. Mm-hmm. We're seeing that in Belarus right now, and I think we'll see it eventually in Russia. And when he's had enough, or actually when, the, when people have had enough, at that point, hopefully, and it's not a high probability, but, I, but I'm still hoping and, and thinking that it could happen, that you end up with a democratic, reasonable, honest government in Russia. And if that were to happen, then I would be the first person to get back on a plane and go back there. Well, I certainly hope that for you as well. Bill, you've been a member of our community for quite some time now, so you're very familiar with the unique individuals who make up this community and and with their stories. And for those listening who are either activist veterans of this community or newcomers or or for those who don't necessarily fall under the more traditional activist umbrella, what can they be doing to promote this type of work? Because You yourself, you were not an activist before this. You were a private citizen, and you were able to galvanize support for this really landmark piece of legislation. So what should others keep in mind when trying to dismantle oppressive systems of dictatorship, whether that's in in Russia or elsewhere? What do you have to say to all the other private citizens who are looking to enact change? I think we're we're, the the, the, the historic... um, job of a human rights activist or a democracy activist was was focusing on on the issue itself and what i've discovered is that you want to focus on the people who are doing the harm Mm -hmm. and focus on their money because that that's where their achilles heel is and so if we can find the people that are doing the bad things and then figure out how to target their money all of a sudden you've got their attention much better than you ever would by saying what you're doing is wrong. Absolutely. Bill, I'd like to end by learning some of Sergei's wisdom as, as you know, and experienced it. Uh, This year, the theme of the Oslo Freedom Forum is resilience. And we want to recognize and, and honor individuals who've been tested by recent crises yet have managed to really remarkably summon this renewed optimism and and purpose in their causes. And obviously, Sergei's ordeal is a testament to his bravery. He made the decision to remain in Russia when he likely knew what dangers awaited him and then to testify against the very people who would eventually ensure his murder. And what, what struck me in reading his story is that, yes, he was incredibly brave. And then to be able to withstand the repercussions of that bravery, that, that was the mark of, of astounding resilience. What did Sergei have in his resilience, uh, let's call it toolbox, that you've taken to heart and that activists in our community can seek to cultivate themselves? Well, Sergei always believed in the law up to the moment that he was killed, and it didn't protect him. But I carried on with, with his belief, and we created a law in his name, which will save other people's lives in the future. And so it's all about, I think, ultimately, justice and law do prevail. It's just a question of how much time and how persistent you have to be. But I've been persistent in his name, in his legacy, in his, in, 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 in his goals, of making sure that the law does prevail and the law has his name on it. Well, Bill, I think that's a beautiful and uplifting note to end on. And I want to thank you for coming on today. And as always, it's been a privilege to have you join us. And we will certainly be following your campaign of justice for Sergei and the progress of Magnitsky legislation around the world and doing our part uh, where we can to aid in that campaign. So thank you. Thank you. In Sergei Magnitsky's 358 days in prison, he wrote hundreds of complaints and letters documenting the human rights abuses, the cruel and degrading and inhumane treatment that he was subjected to. There is no running hot water in my cell, despite the fact that the facilities for hot water are there. 
My complaints about this merely led to a worsening of my conditions. Missing window frames in one cell were repaired only after numerous complaints and only several weeks after the initial appeal. During that time, I became ill from the cold. I have been practically deprived of any opportunity to receive information about what is happening in the world or to get news from members of my family. My letters are sent and received with considerable delays. Instead of three to five days, as was the case earlier when I was held in other prisons, letters now take 15 to 30 days to reach me. Many of the letters that I have sent were never delivered. Complaints about my prison conditions rarely produce any results, and most complaints are simply ignored. In one case, after I appeal to the higher authorities about my prison conditions, those conditions merely got worse. In my eight weeks at Butirsky prison, I have issued nearly 50 statements and complaints addressed to the prison administration. More than half of them were not even considered. At least, they garnered no response. The majority of the others were rejected, although none of them was turned down in writing. My medical appointments and examinations are not carried out. Repeated requests to be allowed to see a doctor have been essentially ignored. As for the prescribed course of treatment, I was told I could follow it when I was released. My participation in court hearings is accompanied by cruel and degrading treatment. On the days when there are hearings, I leave my cell at 7 a.m. and return no earlier than 11 p.m. I get no hot food on those days. Prisoners returning from the court are not immediately sent to their cells, but can be kept for hours in holding cells. In one of these cells, there are no windows or ventilation. There is no drinking water and no normally functioning toilet. After each court appearance, I must spend at least one and a half to two hours in such conditions. These cells are about 20 to 22 square meters, but often hold 70 people at one time. And many of them smoke, meaning that it is impossible to breathe.